The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. In the year 2000, Ben Heckendorn built his first mod. We can rebuild it. Smaller. Better. Portable. Since then, he has continued his work, helping those in need with creative new projects. If you've got an idea you'd like to see built, why not send it to The Ben Hack Show? Automated smart homes are becoming more and more popular, and many new homes have these features already built in. In this episode, we're going to show you how to add these features to existing systems. Therefore, you don't need a brand new home or to even own your home to enjoy these features. Okay, so the first home automation thing I want to try is an automatic door buzzer. Like, when I moved in here, I noticed it had a door buzzer where there's a front door besides your door and you have to push it to buzz people into the front door. Now that's all well and good, but the thing is, certain delivery packages such as UPS, FedEx, um, if they can't find someone to buzz them in, they won't leave it on the front step. They'll put that note, they'll say, we just missed you, blah, blah, blah. Then you gotta drive all the way to FedEx, which is like at least three miles that way to pick up your package. So I'm like, okay, if I know I'm not gonna be at home and something's gonna be delivered at home, why not put a note that says, hey, if you miss me, call this number. And then I could remotely buzz them in. So the question is how to control it. Now, a couple of months ago, Parallax microcontroller sent me some sample pieces and among them was their Parallax SpinnerNet web server. And what this is, it's a little, um, you know, package they make. It's open source or they'll just sell it to you. It has a propeller microcontroller on it and also has a ethernet controller. So you can actually use this thing as a little web server and I'll show you how. All right, so we've hooked up our ethernet cable into our little um, parallax board here. We're just gonna give it some power. All right, now let's update the code. We're just gonna put the web server demo on it for starters. And uh, I've port forwarded to this device on my router, which is kind of important. So let's run this. Okay, so we programmed the uh, web server demo onto the microcontroller and now I've actually got the IP address on my phone, so I'm going to look at it. Now, um, it just has some basic stuff here. It's got a timer, it says Happy New Year's. But the thing that's really cool is that it has these buttons here. And those actually refer to I.O. on the propeller. So I can click them and it will toggle the I.O. See how the page reset. So we can hook up an LED and watch it change, hopefully, by hitting these buttons. All right, so there's a handy accessory port on this um, little package. And it has power, ground, and the four input outputs, as well as the I2C bus. So we're gonna stick this LED into port 27 and then into ground. <clears throat> okay, then on our screen here, over the web, we should be able to toggle the LED by hitting this button. Hey, it worked. So if we can light up an LED, we can do anything. So what I think we should do is make a little add-on board that attaches to this little web server through the expansion port. And instead of lighting up an LED, it'll trigger a relay, which will open the door. So I need some sockets. So I'm gonna remove them off of this uh, extra pinball board I have. There's a far, far better thing they do than they have ever done. It's a far greater circuit they go to than they have ever known. So uh, one limitation with this uh, little web server is that it uses a parallel connection to the ethernet controller. So there's only a few IO pins left to us. There's actually just four of them, but they're all here on this header. So what we can do is we can make a little plug that will allow us to attach this board to a sub board and um, four pins is enough to run some shift registers because the shift registers have clock, data, latch, and then we'll have two shift registers, so we'll have two data. So those four wires, we can hook up to shift registers and get a lot more inputs and outputs. Now here we have a little uh, mechanical relay from, uh, I got from Radio Shack. And when you apply um, power across, I believe it's these two, when you, apply, when you apply power across um, one pole, it causes another one to trigger. And the reason we want to use a relay is I want to make this circuit completely electrically isolated from the door circuit. I mean, I don't know exactly how the door circuit is wired up, so all this is gonna do is connect two points. So that's good, we can keep it separate. Now to make sure that the inputs on the shift register are in a known state, we're going to add pull-up resistors. This side of the resistor will be on positive voltage, and the side that connects to the pins will um, be what actually goes to the switches. So when nothing's hooked up, these will pull up that signal to high or one. 
and then if you connect, if the switch goes to ground, it'll pull that pin to zero. If you uh, had nothing on there, the uh, state of the pins would be unknown and you wouldn't get any valid data. So I'm just using little bits of uh, cutoff lead to wire up my circuit using this perf board. It's crude, but it works. And I'm recycling the bent leads. Yeah, saving millions. One really handy thing to recycle is um, old cell phone chargers. They're small and compact, and because a lot of them hook up to cell phones that use USB, a lot of them are output exactly five volts. And this one has one amp of power too, so we can hook this up to this board here and it'll power these circuits and it'll also power our little web server. So yeah, that's a good use for your old uh, cell phone power supplies. And then also we've got this, which is just a, uh, like a headphone jack wire. This is gonna plug into the um, buzzer box to buzz people in and then it wires up to both sides of the relay. So when the relay triggers, this circuit closes, causing the door to be buzzed. So we're gonna put these items next to each other, see how they're about the same size. And I've got this spare header here, which will plug right into the expansion port. And then we can swap out these wires and uh, give it basically power and all the signaling it needs. And uh, we're only using one. The, this shift register has eight you know, outputs on it. Right now we're just using one for this, but uh, the other seven outputs we can use for other home automation things that can be tied right into this. Also, finally, I've attached a spare temperature controller or sensor from, uh, uh, I think it was from Automatic Can Cooler. This is like the Island of Misfit projects here. So um, I don't know if we're gonna necessarily use this, but it could actually sense the t temperature itself and make you know adjustment decisions off that. All right, now we're back home to test the system. So here on the screen, here's a demonstration program that went onto the spinner net. And I've changed it somewhat. Here we see where we've actually got the HTML. It's uh, actually data inside of the um, propeller program. So we've got the head of the HTML here, and then we actually use some files to build it. And the reason we do this is so we can have a more complicated file, but still be able to add things to it. So the very first thing it does after it says Ben Heck Home Automation is it's going to have the, the temperature and see how we have XX degrees F. Um, we're going to access the temperature sensor that we hooked up, which is I squared C, and then it's gonna be, you know, probably two digits. If it's over 100 degrees in here, we get other problems. So it'll do, it, it'll look at the temperature and then it'll actually change this byte and this byte by accessing it in main memory. And then the next part, we want it to display some buttons. So over here in front page, we have some codes. So this is the cool part where you can actually draw up our buttons in a you know, WYSIWYG program like front page and then the file would just be imported into our program here. So it's all this data, then it'll just actually take this buttons file in. So we can take a look at this. Um, we have four big buttons. The first three don't really do anything, but they could, maybe their temperature control override. But the, the money button is door. So we hit the door button and it buzzes it, allegedly. And uh, these are JavaScript buttons and they re uh, relate to things that are in the program. So we have a table here. Uh, basically, these buttons are made to fit on a, you know, a smartphone, so they're about 350 pixels wide, so they'll be pretty big on the smartphone. So we just um, saved this as our buttons file. So, and then it's incorporated in the code here. We have our HTML header, then we have our temperature, which will show up at the top, and then the buttons, which you just saw. So that's what we'll see on our phone. So let's try it out, let's program it. So I've got a link here, which goes to my router's IP address and is port forwarded to the spinner net. Okay, that was the old one. Let's refresh it. Okay, all right. So there we go. We've got the temperature, which is coming off of the temperature sensor here. And then we have our three door buttons. So we can just do a test. Kids, don't try this at home. Refresh, I'm gonna guess it's probably gonna be more than 80 degrees. Yep, so see, we actually got the temperature from that to increase. So the next thing we're gonna do is I'm going to see if the door will open. So we've attached this plug here, which is gonna go into the door opener thing. Door opener thing, how technical. <laughs> so right now it should be open. So when I click the door, this should beep. And there we go. So we're ready to test it out on the real thing. When this is all finished, this will be in, in an enclosure over here and come around, but for now, we'll just demonstrate. So we'll hook up our controller into the buzzer box. 
All right, we should be ready to go. Oh no, I forgot my keys inside. I'm trapped. Good thing there's an app for that. Haha, -ha, success. See ya suckers. Recently, I took part of an online web tutorial with Ed from CADSoft because I needed to learn Eagle. The first thing I needed to learn in Eagle was how to do the schematics. Everything in Eagle starts with the schematic, so I would take my parts, and the schematic has the electrical connections to the part, not necessarily the physical connections. I would take them into the schematics and learn how to connect them to things on my board. What we were doing in particular was using the Eagle file for an Arduino mega board, so I could place that on a larger circuit board to drive my pinball machine, as you've probably seen on the show before. So what I learned on the web seminar was how to get started in Eagle, move things around, place parts, and also make some custom connections. What I think viewers will find most useful about this tutorial is that you'll see me learn how to start using Eagle, and through that, you will learn as well. For an overview of CADSoft Eagle, go to element14.com forward slash CADSoft. You can also download a free 30-day trial of the program there, and also find additional freeware on the CADSoft website. Stay tuned at element14.com forward slash TBHS to see the complete tutorial that I took with Ed at CADSoft. Part two of our project is going to be a temperature control. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Oh, but you can have a box and it has a computerized temperature control that, you know, adjusts the temperature of your home on a schedule. Well, not everyone lives in a brand new Energy Star compliant robo home. A lot of people have older homes that they rent, like I do, I rent. And, and Allison rents, the camera person holding the camera. So a lot of homes have the standard Honeywell, um, you know, circular thermostat. What I propose we do, and this is gonna sound a little ridiculous, but I think it'll work, is we make some sort of control system where you put something, you either put it below it on a shelf or bolt it to the wall, you put a stepper motor or some sort of, you know, controllable motor, and then it has some sort of gear and the gear has little teeth that match up the ridges on the dial, which those dials have, and then this can rotate either this way or this way, which will turn the dial for you. And we should have enough spare output lines on our door module that the door module could not only open the door, but it could keep track of time and change your temperature for you. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna hook up the um, motor controller to our already existing circuit. There's enough extra I.O. with these shift registers that we can control a stepper motor. Now we had this leftover motor controller from the CD changer episode, and it just so happens that it's exactly what they recommend on the Arduino website when you're hooking up a stepper motor. We're controlling this with the propeller, but it's the same thing. So here's how we have to hook up this controller. We just got the data sheet or the instructions from the Arduino website. And then four of these pins go to the um, processor and we cycle those in a certain way to make the motor go forward or back. And this is a, uh, a bipolar stepper motor, which means it has four wires. See him, it's two coils there and four wires. So we're just gonna get this hooked up and then we'll try controlling it with the computer. Okay, so our motor code is running and I hooked up an LED to one of the inputs. There's four inputs going into the little motor controller and the way you address them, you like go doot, doot, doot in a certain position and that causes the windings in the motor to advance. And I hooked an LED up to it so you can kind of see it happening. Right now it's going quite slow. If we reduce the amount of time between pulses, it'll speed up. So we'll try that next. This is the amount of time between pulses. So if we slow it down, the motor will slow down like one million. All right, here we go. Ooh, it's getting hot. <laughs> Whee! Okay, well, uh, prove that works, so that's good. Yeah. Okay, that's got some heat, so we're gonna wanna sync that. But yeah, so uh, the next thing we're gonna do is we'll hook this up in such a way, and hopefully this has enough power to actually turn the knob, but this will be here and there'll be a disc on it. And the edges of this disc will actually rotate the bottom of the uh, thermostat. So it's like, it'll change the temperature for you. And then we've got some extra pins here on the plug. See so yeah, how there's some extra pins there? So we could actually put some limit switches on either side so it would know where like 65 degrees or 80 degrees are so it doesn't overshoot. All right, so here's the chamber view. There's gonna be a main chamber here on the assembly that holds these parts, which again is the propeller, web server, and then our little controller board. And then we're gonna have an open spot for our temperature sensor. So the cords will come out this way and the power cords will probably come out that way. 
Okay, so I'm using a V-bit now to uh, make the disc that will interface with the existing Honeywell uh, thermostat. All right, so I routed all the parts to make the wall unit. Okay, so now we're ready to assemble the wall unit. Okay, so now we're gonna bolt the motor in place into the case. So there are two times a day the system's going to need to think about. When you go to work, it'll turn the heat up, which will turn the air conditioning off. Then about an hour, or maybe half an hour, before you get back home from work, before you get here, it'll thoughtfully turn it back down. So by the time you get here, it'll be nice and comfortable. So there's two times a day the system will need to think about, you know, leaving and coming back. So to keep track of the time, we're going to need something called a real-time clock, or RTC. So the spinner net has a built-in real-time clock on it. So I looked up this data sheet so you can see how to access it. And it's I squared C, like quite a few things. So it's right on the same bus with the system's EEPROM and as well as the temperature control. But everything on the I squared C bus has its own address, so you shouldn't have collisions. So we just uh, look down at the bottom here in our design and, and we see how we're supposed to read the data. Basically, you can get day, month, hour, minute, second. And like our previous project, I think it was for Aaron Matthews, this clock is binary code decimal. So we have to put the numbers together in a certain way. It's basically designed in such a way that um, it's, it'll make digits correctly. So instead of giving you like the number 23, it'll give you two and a three so you can make your digits. So let's uh, hook this into our program and see if we can get a clock to come out of this. I put a routine in here where it'll just um, wait a second, get the time, print the time, and then wait another second. So if we go down to the serial monitor, we should be able to see what serial commands is sending back to the computer. All right, we see on the screen here, um, we got the hours and military time, and then the minutes and the seconds. So see how it keeps updating? And uh, let's see. Uh, we have our clock going here, so we really don't even need the minutes and seconds because we're just looking at the hour, but what we'll probably do with the program is when the minute is 59, once it reaches you know, 59 or zero, it's like, oh, the hour changed. And then it'll say, is it the hour that I'm supposed to do something? And then if it is, then it'll turn the dial whichever way it's supposed to. Not making contact. It must be some sort of error in my design. Darn it. So I'm not sure that the um, corrugated disc is the best solution. Um, perhaps a belt? Allison lent me this. It was stuck in her hair. So what if we had a belt to go around it and the belt came down here and attached to, oops, to our stepper motor? And that would actually be good because then your stepper motor could be bolted down here without having to put anything in the wall. So I think we'll try that approach next. Either get a belt from McMaster Car or you know, either a hair shop or something. Okay, to prove the concept, I just grabbed this big beefy stepper motor. We don't need one this big, but I didn't have time to order a medium sized one. So uh, I'll give you a demonstration of the machine changing the temperature. I'm gonna use the phone to override it since we can't really sit here and wait for it to be five o'clock. So yeah, let's see the cold. So yeah, this belt system allows you to change the temperature without, you know, wrecking anything on the walls. It's basically a non-destructive change and uh, it works. I mean, we want to, you know, basically we can set something here and weight it down and then just have the right length of belt or have the object far enough this way that the belt is tight. But then, yeah, it seems to work pretty good with the big stepper motor. 70, <laughs> and as a belt, my belt is, uh, <laughs> is a piece of, uh, wire from a microphone, <laughs> but yeah, whatever works, right? That's all the time we have for today. We got the door buzzer working correctly, but the thermostat, we didn't quite get it all the way there. We proved the concept, but we didn't have time to make a finished product. How would you finish it? Do you have any ideas? Share your ideas on element14.com forward slash TBHS. In our next episode, we're going to be modifying some Xbox controllers for accessibility use and also getting back to working on our pinball machines. We'll see you then. Stay tuned at element14.com forward slash TBHS where you can join the discussion, suggest builds for the show, and even have a chance to win upcoming builds. Remember, you can always email build ideas to benheck at element14.com. Thanks for watching.